All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Odsley, and I am the Writing Across Media Facilitator for Vermont Studio Center. And I'm so pleased to be here this morning um, with Zell Boggs, uh, Vermont Studio Center's virtual visiting writer. A little bit of introductions to begin. Um, this event is sponsored by the Rana Jaffe Foundation, which supports women writers at critical times in their writing life through grants, fellowships, and awards. We are grateful for their continued partnership. Today, um, Bell's Craft Talk is titled, You Do Look Funny in Your Bathing Suit, Humor and Life's Dreadful Moments. So I'm gonna give a short introduction and then I will switch us all over to speaker mode and Belle will have the floor. She will also be doing some screen sharing with our Google Slides that she's created for us. Belle Boggs is the author of The Gulf, a novel, The Art of Waiting, and Mattapunai Queen's stories. The Art of Waiting was a finalist for the Penn Diamondstein Spiel Vogel Award for the Art of the Essay and was named a best book of the year by Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, The Globe and Mail, Buzzfeed, and O, Oprah's Magazine. Mattapunai Queen, a collection of linked stories set along Virginia's Mattapunai River, won the Bakeless Prize and the Library of Virginia Literary Award, and was a finalist for the 2010 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. She has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the North Carolina Arts Council, and the Breadloaf and Sewanee Writers Conferences. Her stories and essays have appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, Orion, the Paris Review, Harper's, Ecotone, Plowshares, and elsewhere. She is an Associate Professor of English at North Carolina State University, where she also directs MFA program in creative writing. She is currently on leave from there and we have the immense privilege of having her join us. Um, I'm going to switch everything over to speaker mode, let people in um, who are waiting in the waiting room and give the floor to Belle. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm really appreciative of uh, Vermont Studio Center, which makes um, such an important space for so many writers. Um, and I was um, imagining that I would be there this beautiful fall, but I'm happy to be able to be here with you all in person or on Zoom. Um, and, um, and I appreciate that you're all supportive of important institutions like the Vermont Studio Center. So, um, um, yeah, so thanks for joining us. We're gonna talk this morning about finding and harnessing the humor that is survival in life's dreadful moments. And it may be useful um, for those of you who are still recovering from last night's debate, I hope anyway. Um, I'm going to share my screen in just a second, um, but I want to kind of talk about what we're going to do this morning. Um, in some ways, humor is a really difficult thing to teach because it's so subjective and it's also so personal, especially the humor that speaks to us in fiction. So in part today, um, I guess this is going to be a tour of things that I find really funny and that I return to in my head when I need a burst of energy or like uh, just some good feeling in times of dreadfulness, which we have so much of these days. Um, even though actually the subject of most of the pieces that I'm going to share with you today is dread. Um, I hope that we can find a useful framework for thinking about what makes these pieces work and maybe some inspiration that we can bring back to our own work. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see, share. All right. And let me move this out of the way. Put this in presentation mode. All right, um, Sarah, can you like thumbs up if you, you can see this? 
All right, that's great. Um, this is my first time giving this particular talk. All right, this is my daughter Beatrice on the left last Halloween. Um, it was not, of course, a dreadful moment at all, especially compared to this year when because of our failure to heed the pumpkin on the right, we cannot safely have Halloween on a full moon Saturday. Although to be honest, um, a lot of bad things were happening last year as they have consistently and increasingly happened since 2006 or since 2000. I want to get historical about it since always. Anyway, um, B, as you can maybe tell, um, is dressed as one of her literary heroes, Nancy Drew. Um, as some of you may know, my first nonfiction book was about waiting for Beatrice and hoping for this particular child, um, during which time I often imagined myself reading to a child. I did not, however, imagine myself reading Nancy Drew, which if you've ever tried to read it out loud to anyone is quite dreadful indeed. I basically will never read these books to be. Uh, Laura Linney does the audiobooks and she does a fine job, bless her. Um, and for a while, this frustrated Beatrice until one day I explained to her that I only like funny stories, which is true. My favorite stories and books are not comedies exactly. They're often very serious books. But I think it's nearly universally true that the books and stories that I love best and hold closest are books that address an essential darkness or dreadfulness with humor and that use humor to draw me closer to the perspectives of their characters. The title of this talk comes from one of my favorite stories as a kid, which I still read and find hilarious, which I'm gonna share with you, A Swim by Arnold Lobel. And I'm gonna make this, I think I can do this in presentation mode too. Yes, I can. Um, so my parents did a really good job, I think, of giving us books to read and reading to us. But a thing about my childhood and maybe about yours too is that we just did not have the same endless access to content that today's kids have. There was no internet, no weird Twitter, no videos of mini schnauzers talking about COVID. There was no COVID. Um, a lot of the humor in our house was about the rep repetition of absurdity, Wil milking what was funny about a story or a picture or one of our three VHS videos for everything it had. There's maybe one line in the book Little Women that is really funny, which is the line about Joe imagining that Marmy should shake her fist at the girls when they leave the house. And as a kid, I reread that line while looking at a photo uh, or uh, an illustration of Marmy gazing out the window and imagined her shake the, the picture of Marmy shaking her fist. And I thought about it a lot. And that is my first point. To find the humor in something that you're writing, it really helps to study it, to think about all the the ways that what you're experiencing differs from what you expect or how your experience isolates you. This is also true of um, Arnold Lobel's story, A Swim, um, which I read over and over again um, my, to myself and then later um, to my little brother. So it starts I, this way. Frog and Toad went down to the river. They're like, oh, it's a great day for a swim. And Toad says, I'm going to go behind these rocks. I'm going to put on my bathing suit. Frog's like, no, I don't wear a bathing suit. I'm a, I'm a frog. Um, let's see. Oh, I can't page through. Hmm. Hold on. Let me go back. Oh, hold on a second, guys. Sorry, let me get back into this and page out of it. Okay, I might have to just sort of talk you through this. I'm going to screen share again and try this again. Sorry. Uh, share screen. There we go. All right. So we're just going to look at this. Uh, all right. We're just going to kind of look at it this way. Thumbs up, Sarah, if you can see the, the book, if you don't mind. Okay. Great. All right. So um, Toad's like, well, I do wear a bathing suit because um, I just do. And um, so 
he says, though, after I put on my bathing suit, you may not look at me until I get in the water, all right? And Frog's like, well, why? And then Toad is like, because I look funny in my bathing suit. And Frog is his best friend, so he's like, sure, all right, whatever. And so they go, and they swim, they splash around, they have a good time. And then Toad is starting to realize here, and this is important, too, like Arnold Lobel thought of himself um, as, I mean, I think he's just such a brilliant writer, um, but he thought of himself um, first as an artist. Um, he said he had no trouble um, drawing. Um, that was never a problem, but he really had to work over his texts, over the writing, which is interesting to me because I, I find his stories just like many of them very, very powerful, even as they are stories for children. But here you see his strengths as, as an artist. Here's Toad in the water realizing he's going to have to get out of there eventually. And so um, he tells Frog, please tell that turtle to go, go away. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't want him to see me in my bathing suit. And so Frog obeys and he says, all right, you know, you got to go away. And the turtle's like, but I don't want to. I haven't seen anything funny. And then all these other animals, these lizards, and the snake comes along, and then some dragonflies and a mouse, and they're always, they're all like, oh shit, something funny is about to happen, and I want to see it, and no, I'm not going um, away. I'm going to stay and watch. And so <laughs> there they are. And, and Toad is like, well, I'm just going to have to get out of this water because I'm catching a cold. And he does. And everybody laughs at him. Even his best friend, um, Frog, laughs at him. And um, to me, it's a really perfect story about um, isolation, sadness, and loneliness um, by a writer who, or really just kind of about a moment of isolation, sadness, uh, isolation and loneliness by a writer who knew, an illustrator who knew a lot about those topics. There's a very, very simple setup. Frog and Toad are going swimming, but Toad wears a bathing suit, which we do not get to see at first. Um, a toad in a bathing suit is, of course, a funny image, but what makes the story hilarious to me is the triangulation between what toad wants, what frog wants, and what all the other animals who haven't seen anything funny in a long time want to see. There's also an escalation of transgressions, which is important too. Toad wears a bathing suit, which is against nature's law, and he also knows that, he, that it's funny looking. He swims for as long as he can. Frog is a good friend, and he diligently and politely asks the other animals to leave. The fact that he can explain it in clear, succinct language makes it extra funny. Toad thinks he looks funny. He does not want you to see him. The other animals will not leave. They want to see Toad in his bathing suit. Then Toad accepts his humiliation and he gets out and everybody laughs, even Frog. And Toad, of course, says, of course, I look funny in my bathing suit. Lobel never explains why Toad wears the bathing suit. What's funny about the story is the distance between Toad, who insists on the suit, even though, of course, it looks funny, and all the other animals. Next, I want to show you a little um, clip, the opening from the 40-year-old version, um, which is a film written, directed, and starring Radha Blank about a Black playwright named Radha who is staring down her 40th year. Um, she's teaching at a high school in Harlem, trying to figure out whether or not to sell out to white audiences. It's a great movie for writers, late bloomers, or anyone who's lived in New York or worked in theater or contemplated poverty porn or selling out. But I want to talk about the opening scenes of the film and what I see them doing. Um, I want you to notice as we watch just the first couple of minutes, the way that Radha is separated from other people in different ways, by the walls of her apartment, the medium of late night TV, and on the bus to work. This is just going to be a couple of minutes of this. All right, so um, the triangul triangulation here is Rada, New York, and us, the viewers. The job of Rada Blank, the writer, director, star, 
is to draw audiences into alignment with what is essentially a transgressive or outsider stance in a time of dreadfulness, being late for work while also having, uh, being lonely, while also dealing with um, the one year anniversary of the loss of her mother. So at home, she eavesdrops on her neighbors, but then is disappointed when their sexual moans turn into sobs. On the bus, she's also separated from her brother, whose voicemail we hear, and she watches in dismay as people in wheelchairs on crutches and using walkers approach the bus and then is shamed by the bus driver who tells the other passengers that she doesn't want to let disabled people on the bus. Like a swim, this opening introduces us to a triangulation, Rada, the other New Yorkers, and us. She says, fuck me, when she sees these people. Her stance is transgressive and selfish. We see later that she's often late for work with basically no consequences. But we are drawn into alignment with her, especially when we see the second stop, which makes us culpable, which invests us in her character before the credits are even done rolling, which is essential to the journey that Blank is going to take us on, that she wants to take us on, through a lot of dreadful moments in the rest of the film. I'm gonna share my screen again and move over back to the slides. Presentation mode, all right, past Halloween. Great Expectations by Charles Dickens offers another early example, or early in the novel example, of a dreadful moment of, and isolation or triangulation. Pip, as you may remember, is an orphan who lives with his horrible sister, Mrs. Joe, and he's just met an escaped convict who has threatened him unless he brings him food. Um, and that was in chapter one, and this is from chapter two. So I'm just gonna read through um, chapter two this little beginning of this little part from chapter two and then talk about it. My sister had a trenchant way of cutting our bread and butter for us that never varied. First, with her left hand, she jammed the loaf hard and fast against her bib, where it sometimes got a pin into it and sometimes a needle, which we afterwards got into our mouths. Then she took some butter, not too much, on a knife and spread it on the loaf in an apothecary kind of way, as if she were making a plaster, using both sides of the knife with a slapping dexterity and trimming and molding the butter off round the crust. Then she gave the knife a final smart, smart wipe on the edge of the plaster and then sawed a very thick round off the loaf, which she got, which she finally, before separating from the loaf, hewed into two halves of which Joe got one and I the other. On the present occasion, though I was hungry, I dared not eat my slice. I felt that I must have something in reserve for my dreadful acquaintance and his ally, the still more dreadful young man. I knew Mrs. Joe's housekeeping to be of the strictest kind and that my larcenous researches might find nothing available in the safe. Therefore, I resolved to put my hunk of bread and butter down the leg of my trousers. The effort of resolution necessary to the achievement of this purpose I found to be quite awful. It was as though, as if I had to make up my mind to leap from the top of a high house or plunge into a great depth of water, and it was made the more difficult by the unconscious Joe. In our already mentioned Freemasonry as fellow sufferers, and in his good-natured companionship with me, it was our evening habit to compare the way we bit through our slices by silently holding them up to each other's admiration now and then which stimulated us to new exertions. Tonight, Joe several times invited me by the display of his fast diminishing slice to enter upon our usual friendly competition, but he found me each time with my yellow mug of tea on one knee and my untouched bread and butter on the other. At last, I desperately considered that the thing I contemplated must be done and that it had best be done in the least improbable manner consistent with the circumstances. I took advantage of a moment when Joe had just looked at me and got my bread and butter down my leg. Joe was evidently made uncomfortable by what he supposed to be my loss of appetite and took a thoughtful bite out of his slice, which he didn't seem to enjoy. He turned it about in his mouth much longer than usual, pondering it over a good deal, and after all, gulped it down like a pill. He was about to take another bite and had just got his head on one side 
for a good purchase on it when his eye fell on me and he saw that my bread and butter was gone. The wonder and consternation with which Joe stopped on the threshold of his bite and stared at me were too evident to escape my sister's observation. What's the matter now, said she smartly as she put down her cup. I say, you know, muttered Joe, taking his, shaking his head at me in very serious remonstrance. By Pip, old chap, you'll do yourself a mischief. It'll stick somewhere. You can't have chawed it, Pip. What's the matter now, repeated my sister more sharply than before. If you can cough any trifle on it up, Pip, I'd recommend you do it, said Joe, all aghast. Manners is manners, but still, you're else your elf. By this time, my sister was quite desperate, so she pounced on Joe, and taking him by the two whiskers, knocked his head for a little while against the wall behind him, while I sat in the corner, looking guiltily on. So one of the things that we see happening here is that Pip is further isolated from his only ally at this point, Joe Gargery, who does not know the secret Pip is carrying. The scene escalates and becomes hilarious in a few ways that have to do with distance and contrast. Joe's general sweetness is contrasted by Mrs. Joe's horribleness. And so there's that distance, but Joe also, because of the secret, secrecy is punished. This is made much funner, funnier through the summary. She pounced on Joe and taking him by the two whiskers, knocked his head for a little while against the wall behind him while I sat in the corner looking guiltily on. Summary here implies that this violence is commonplace. Another way that the greats use distance and dreadfulness to make us laugh and draw us closer is through the observation of detail. In Great Expectations, the detail is invested in the bread, full of pins, plastered with butter, the way Mrs. Joe hews it in two, the way it's carefully chawed by Joe and Pip so they don't get pins and needles in their mouths. Paul Beatty's Booker Prize winning novel, The Sellout, is about a black man who accepts the last surviving little rascal as his slave and segregates transportation and the local high school, actions that land him in the very beginning of the novel in front of the US Supreme Court. What could possibly be more dreadful and also more transgressive? Note that the dreadful novel, the biggest, most some systemic stuff, the backdrop of American racism, slavery, police violence, and segregation. The sellout is a comic masterpiece utterly inimitable, but I think it's worth looking at the way that distance, alienation, and triangulation work in an early paragraph. I'm only going to show you a paragraph because I want to show you how much complexity and backstory and humor Beatty packs into four sentences. So I'll read to you this paragraph. Hampton Fisk, my lawyer and old friend, calmly wafts away the last of the pot smoke, then engulfs me in an antifungal cloud of spray can air freshener. I'm too high to speak, so we greet each other with chin up, what's up, nods, and share a knowing smile because we both reckon, recognize the scent. Tropic breeze, same shit we used to hide the evidence from our parents because it smelled like angel dust. If moms came home, kicked off the espadrilles and found the crib redolent of apple cinnamon or strawberries and cream, she'd know we'd been smoking. But if the crib smelled like PCP, then the stench could be blamed on Uncle Rick and them. Or alternatively, she could say nothing, too tired to deal with the possibility that her only child was addicted to Sherm and hope the problem would simply go away. There are many distances in this paragraph. There's the distance between the narrator and sobriety. There's the distance between the narrator, his attorney, and the court. In memory, there's a mother, enforcer of norms, who is too tired to entertain the idea that her child has gotten into more trouble than she can get him out of. The humor here, as in Great Expectations, works through specificity and contrast between the respectability of air freshener with what it smells like, PCP, between the name of the air freshener, Tropic Breeze, and its stench, between a mother who comes home from work and kicks off her espadrilles, the most carefree, professional woman's shoe, 
who then has to decide if her only child is addicted to Sherm or if it's Uncle Rick and them. She's someone who works somewhere where she dresses up, but also has relatives who might smoke PCP in her home. PCP also has three different names in this paragraph, which travel in order of humor. Angel dust, then PCP, which for some reason is funnier than angel dust, then Sherm, which is a Los Angeles specific street name for the drug. If you have not read the sellout, it is many people, many people will say that it is the funniest book they've ever read. All right, here's something from Julie Hecht. Julie Hecht is a writer I love and find strangely hilarious, but her writing often barrels along for many pages about the mundane, often class-driven preoccupations of her narrator. And then it's suddenly very sharply funny. The humor surprises you. Like the character Rada in the 40-year-old version, Hex narrators are selfish and transgressive, but they're also less immediately likable. There's an even greater distance between the reader and the opinionated narrator or narrators. Um, her books tend to have um, a central narrator who's quite similar across story collections and, um, and novels. Um, who are, and they're, they're often very concerned with things that we might find petty or out of date, such as when it's appropriate to wear black shoes, how to remove the polo logo from a Ralph Lauren shirt without ripping the fabric, or how to deal with the terror of the second Bush administration. So I'm gonna read um, this section from Perfect Vi Vision from her collection, Do the Windows Open. January went by, February two, and as we got into March, I knew I had almost no time left if I was ever going to get to Midtown Manhattan before the heat and humidity started, as they do now in April, due to the greenhouse effect and the hole in the ozone layer, which are both happening this minute and not as was first predicted in 100 years. The world meltdown has begun. Still, I let part of March go by until I had to go to a dentist appointment in Rockefeller Center another feared midtown location i went this once to a very mean dentist who seemed to be a man on the verge of suicide you've read the dentists have the highest suicide rate not high enough i say but this one appeared to be following a psychiatrist's orders go to work keep up a routine x-ray teeth poke at fillings drill teeth fill them continue your normal life stay on the antidepressant medication and come in for psychiatric visits every day the man didn't even have the patience to listen to which tooth was the problem. As I tried to say, second from the back, on the lower left, the man had to stare away in a state of subdued rage. I saw it in his eyes, and when he drilled away at an old filling, he threw his dental instruments onto my chest instead of the little dental work table. He threw them hard. He probably wanted to stab me with them. He even threw the drill. So what makes um, this section um, and the narrative, narrative voice work um, in part is that underlying the narrator's transgressive feelings is something deeper. It's not about the dentist or having to go to Midtown. It's about the world meltdown, which has started well before it was predicted. It's about the hole in the ozone layer. Dread is projected onto the dentist, onto Midtown. Like Dickens, there's also a little bit of slapstick violence that is summarized. He, quote, threw his dental instruments onto my chest, end quote, has the feeling of Mrs. Joe knocking Joe's head about. Well, we've also already seen the narrator's secret bad feelings. You've heard dentists have the highest suicide rate, not high enough, she says. She then proceeds to mock the next dentist, as well as psychiatry, stay on the antidepressant medication and come in for psychiatric visits every day. Here I'll just say, do you have a secret or not so secret thing against dentists, chiropractors, therapists, people who keep ferrets as pets? Apologies to any therapists or chiropractors in the group or dentists. Um, but um, you can harness your unreasonable biases, even your malevolence, and give it to your point, give them to your point of view character and to their anxiety. 
Another favorite of mine is Joy Williams. Um, her story, Honored Guest, is the title story from her 2004 collection, Honored Guest. In this story, which I'll read a little section of, a teenage girl and her mother struggle to figure out how to spend the last months of their time together. Lenore, the mother, is dying of cancer. I'm gonna read the, just this little section to you. In the morning, Lenore said, would you get a tattoo with me? We could do this together. I don't think it's creepy, she added. I think you'll be glad later. A pretty one, just small somewhere. What do you think? The more she considered it, the more it seemed the perfect thing to do. What else could be done? She'd already given Helen her wedding ring. I'll get him to come over, to the, over, over here to the house. I'll arrange it, Lenore said. Helen couldn't defend herself against this notion. She still felt sleepy. She was always sleepy. There was something wrong with her mother's idea, but not much. But Lenore could not arrange it. When Helen returned from school, her mother said, it can't be done. I'm so upset and I've lost interest. So I'll give you the short version. I called, I must have made 20 calls. At last, I got someone to speak to me. His name was Smokin' Joe, and he was 100 miles away, but sounded as though he'd do it. And I asked him if there was any place he didn't tattoo. And he said, faces, dicks, and hands. Mom, Helen said, her, her face reddened. And I asked him if there was anyone he wouldn't tattoo. And he said, drunks and the dying. So that was that. But you didn't have to tell him. You won't have to tell him, Helen said. That's true, Lenore said dispiritedly. Then she looked angrily at Helen. Are you crazy? Sometimes I think you're crazy. This is Helen facing the judgment from Lenore because she's afraid and because Lenore is afraid and because their situation is impossible. But it's also funny. The humor grows out of the contrasts between Lenore's point of view and Helen's. There's also the contrast between Lenore's ideas and reality, between a mother-daughter small tattoo, a pretty one, just small somewhere, and the related dialogue between Lenore and Smoke and Joe. If this had been rendered and seen rather than summarized, if we saw Lenore getting up the nerve to call, then proceeding through the conversation, then telling Hel Helen, it would not be nearly as funny. What's funny is Helen's face reddening as we proceed through the dreadfulness. Faces, dicks, and hands. Drunks and the dying. There's also, I should mention, something of the ineffable in Joy Williams' story, as there always is in her work. Quote, there was something wrong with her mother's idea, but not much, end quote. And Lenore's sudden anger. Is she angry with herself? with the idea that Helen would not go through, would go through with a tattoo from someone named Smoke and Joe, that she herself will soon leave this child who is not prepared to make the right decisions, even the one she herself suggested. Maybe you've noticed that we're sort of descending through the pits of dreadfulness. We've been through fear of bodily harm to an orphan, to the American legal system, to dentistry and Midtown, to the anticipation of dying while one's child is young. And here we are with Lori Moore and her famous story about the anticipation of loss of a child. It's a story that makes great use of free and direct discourse as we watch the narrator berate herself for her predictable, boring love of her child who is now threatened with an unnamed illness. Just once, before he was born, she said, healthy, I just want the kid to be rich. A joke for God's sake. After he was born, she announced that her life had again be, had become a daily sequence of mind-wrecking chores, the same ones over and over, like a novel by Mrs. Camus. Another joke. These jokes will kill you. She told too often and with too much enjoyment the story of how the baby said hi to his high chair waved at the lake wave, shouted goody, 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 in what seemed to be a Russian accent, pointed at his eyes and said ice. And all that nonsensical baby talk, wasn't it a stitch? Canonical babbling, the language experts called it. He recounted whole stories in it, totally made up, she could tell. 
he embroidered, he fished. He exaggerated. What a card. To friends, she spoke of his eating habits. Carrots, yes. Tuna, no. She mentioned too much. His side-splitting giggle. Did she have to be so boring? Did she have no consideration for others, for the intellectual demands and courtesies of human society? Would she not even attempt to be more interesting? It was a crime against the human mind not even to try. Now her baby, for all these reasons, lack of motherly gratitude, motherly judgment, motherly proportion, will be taken away. You might have noticed that with the exception of Moore and Williams, the other writing here is all first person, which Sarah asked about last night when we were talking. I don't think first person is necessarily the funniest or the go-to for dark humor or satire, but it is worth noting that if we're talking about bridging distances, then finding a way to get us closer to the third person protagonist, if we're using a third person protagonist, while allowing that person to be her utterly unreasonable self is useful. Moore and Williams both often use free and direct discourse, slipping into characters' thoughts to bring us closer to the, the, these characters. Finally, we come to Miriam Taves, who mines very dark truths and experiences to write books that are also very funny. Her novel, All My Puny Sorrows, is about the relationship between two ex-Mennonite sisters, one who's phenomenally talented, but also clinically depressed and suicidal, and another who is both trying to save her and also honor her wishes, which are to die in Switzerland through euthanasia. She does not die this way, and the narrator, as you'll see in the selection, is both left behind and guilty. I'll read this. We don't talk about Switzerland or whether I should have taken my sister to Switzerland to help her die. I'm pretty sure Elf never mentioned Switzerland to my mother and I don't dare ask her about it. In the evening when her Samaritan work is done, my mother pours herself a honking big glass of red wine and watches her beloved Blue Jays get creamed again. Nora and I can hear her from the second and third floor shouting at her television on the main floor. Send them home, hustle man. We don't flinch, we're used to it. She's been a Jason forever and knows the stats and the stories behind all the players. All right, that guy's blown his rotator cuff, that guy's throwing garbage, that guy tested positive for some hoo-ha. The CL they just signed, well, he's on the DL with a pulled groin. They're calling him up from AAA. My mother had something like a date a few weeks ago. She told the old fellow, as she called him, I think he's 10 years younger than she is, that what she'd like to do is get a glass of wine somewhere. This wine habit is something she's pick, quickly picked up in Toronto. She's been buying a Merlot lately with a label that says dare, and then go to a James, Jay's game. She invited me along, and the whole time I chatted with the guy who was not that interested in baseball, but I found out smokes two joints a day for his advanced arthritis. You're dating a pothead, I told her. Meanwhile, my mom watched the game like a scout, hunched over and beady-eyed and recorded everything, hits and misses and runs and errors into her program. When the guy tried to talk to her, to ask her if she'd like a hot dog or something, she said, come on, um, wake up. What are you doing? Snyder, two men out and the base is loaded. After the game, after we dropped off her date somewhere in the east end of the city. I asked her what kinds of things he did, and she said she didn't really know. He just got himself a phone, though, so he wouldn't have to call her from a payphone anymore. He goes to the University of Toronto, she said. Cool, I said. What for? To shower, she said. So there are two things I want to point out about this section. One, that the book does not end where you think or would think it would end. It lightens its darkness following Elf's death with scenes of family life and survival, which includes watching their mother date and take pleasure in life even after her beloved daughter has died from suicide. The second is that in this section and in general in the novel, the narrator is a kind of straight woman. 
She's a mess, but she's also generally a reactive character who wants the other characters to behave. But her reactions are important, and her point of view humanizes every character and every character's choices. Even as she is describing her own isolation, being stuck talking to her mom's pothead new boyfriend, who is also ignored by her mother, we are drawn to her mother and we are drawn to her. In relating the scene to us, she's working out for herself. Where do I land on this the side of life as represented by pothead boyfriends, baseball, big honking glasses of red wine, or is her fate to continuously experience the loss of her sister? Near the end of the book, Yoli, that's the narrator, writes a letter to Elf, who in death has become, she says, the keeper of her secrets. And I'm going to read from this little section. By the way, she writes, I finally checked out your beloved D.H. Lawrence, Remember when you expressed incredulity at my not having read Lady Chatterley's Lover? God, you're a snob sometimes. Well, I read it, and yeah, the sex was hot. I'd find time in my busy schedule of needlepoint and flower arranging to visit that guy in the woods, too. I wonder if Frida wrote those parts for D.H. and then just had to keep her mouth shut while he racked up the fame and lived in fancy hotels in France with hippie girls. Anyway, you're right about the first paragraph. I want someone to project it on the front of my house in giant letters made of light and shadows. And if they flickered a bit, that would be the best. And of course they disappear in the sunshine because everything does. And that would be perfect. Quote, ours is essentially a tragic age. So we refuse to take it tragically. The cataclysm has happened. We are among the ruins. We start to build up new little habits habitats to have new little hopes. It is rather hard work. There is now no smooth road into the future, but we go round or scramble over the obstacles. We've got to live no matter how many skies have fallen. And that is the end of my talk. And I thank you. And that's the last pumpkin. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, and thank talk you. For a bit. Um, feel, feel free to drop your questions in the chat or um, wave your hand and unmute. And if you all would like to unmute right now and give Belle a round of applause, that'd be wonderful. It's okay, I've switched it back to gallery mode. Um, so if you would like to um, ask a question, feel free to do that. And also you could drop your question in the chat if you'd like. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I, I, love, I love the talk, Belle. It's a fascinating, fascinating topic. And uh, it occurred to me um, with your last example that it's a perfect description of uh, <clears throat> the book Pride and Prejudice where Elizabeth <clears throat> is, the, uh, is the character <laughs> surrounded <laughs> by, by crazies, and uh, she, has to, she has to deal with that. Yeah, and, and, and Yoli, I mean, you know, as a contempor contemporary, um, you know, uh, woman um, in a contemporary novel, you know, she's, um, you know, she's definitely got her struggles, you know, um, and in some ways, um, you know, it has a harder time keeping things together than her sister, Elfrida, just on that one, you know, she does not want her sister to die. And the question is what, um, you know, what is her, what is her responsibility when that is what her, her, her sister feels she must do? Um, you know, what is her responsibility to her sister? It's a wonderful book. And um, Miriam Taves is a really wonderful example of writing about really dark things. Someone asked last night about write, writers who um, deal with faith communities in a respectful way, but also address, um, you know, some of the complexities and difficulties of um, faith communities. And Miriam Taves, who was born and grew up in a Mennonite um, community, um, 
you know, like a tr really traditional Mennonite family um, or really traditional Mennonite community um, writes about like really, really dark um, outcomes of like pa patriarchal structures within those communities. And that's not really what All My Puny Sorrows is about, but that is what Women Talking is about. And which is also based on a really horrible true story. And I remember when I read about Women Talking, I thought, oh, this is gonna be too hard to read. Um, this, is, this is so dark, um, but she manages it to respect the darkness of the, um, the, the subject of that book, which is, um, uh, you know, abuse and rape um, uh, with just like this masterful lightness. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a remarkable book and I, I love her. Oh, let's see, there's yeah. some. Yeah, there was a question. Um, what do you find doesn't work in humor? You know, I think that's, that's really hard to say. I mean, because, um, you know, I, like I said at the beginning, humor is so, um, it's so subjective. And so something that is like, ha ha funny to somebody else might not work for me, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just doesn't work necessarily for me. And so I think we all have to define that for ourselves. I do think that in writing humor, kind of setting out to be funny is not the same and maybe not as effective as just trying to channel what is the essential sense of humor of the character that we're writing about. Um, and I mean, you know, there, we all know some people who don't have, you know, maybe much of a sense of humor and, um, you know, and, and, but I think it's in there somewhere with most people. I used to teach first grade a long time ago and we cert and I know from that experience of teaching first graders that we certainly all start out with a sense of humor. And so what is it in a character um, and how they move through the world and kind of the distance as I was sort of talking about between their minds and what they can't express to the world um, or what they want that is not, um, not acceptable and the rest of the world, right? And so channeling that rather than thinking, okay, I'm gonna write this really funny scene, um, you know, can maybe help us get to some um, darker places. Or more interesting places, at least. Hi, Belle. It's nice to see you. Hey, Taylor. Nice to see you too. Um, so I was just, I was just kind of thinking about what you were saying earlier about um, studying your your dreadful moments and like really looking at them. And I don't, I guess I don't know if this is a question, but just wondering what you think about this and the idea of like your dreadful moments are sometimes things that like you don't want to look at. Um, and so even if you recognize that like there might be some humor present or something worth mining, how, how do you get past that like hurdle of like, do I really want to like consider this or, or write about this dreadful, this dreadful moment? I know that that is something that I have struggled with. So I wonder what you think about that. That is a really good question. I think it helps in life. I mean, just beyond writing, I think it helps in life to have someone that you can talk to. And I feel like you're a person like that for me. Um, and I hope I'm that person for you too. But to have someone that you can just like express, that you, that you can just, you know, express your dreadful moments too and talk about and la and even kind of poke fun at how you are enduring that dreadful moment too. I, I like some people I know m might know that like back in the spring, I was, um, yeah, early spring or like winter, I was carrying around this packet um, that was sent to me um, by um, the Henrico Doctors Hospital um, in Virginia. Um, I hope I don't get in trouble for mentioning this hospital and their horrible packet of information that they sent me. <laughs> but it was, um, it, was, it was for organ donation because I'm um, working on, um, on uh, I'm, a, I'm a match, um, a, a, a kidney match for my dad. And um, which is like really a 
profound and like scary thing to think about. And it scares me to think about donating a kidney, no matter how I, I like, you know, it, it scares me that my dad needs a kidney. Um, you know, and, and, and this packet is from a, a hospital that my parents were considering talking to. And my, my big focus for like a whole month of my life, this was before the pandemic, was how I could talk, to, talk them out of this terrible hospital, which is in a town called Mechanicsville. Um, and not that far from Central Garage, which is where the high school I went to was. But anyway, this packet was like, had all these, it had like a photograph of what your like abdomen would look like after you had the, the donation. And it was like the ugliest picture I have ever seen. And then it also had things like, oh, maybe you should stop smoking. Just like a couple, at least don't have a cigarette before, like a couple days before you go in. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like the expectation of health from this hospital. And I was just carried around and it was really dog-eared and like grubby from being in my backpack and me taking it out and like showing it to people and telling them about it and kind of going, I probably told you about it, Kat, I'm sure I took it to your office and showed it to you. And, you know, like I actually recycled it um, kind of a couple months ago because they've moved on there. We're not going to go to that hospital. Thank goodness. But um, that, you know, I think that something like that, you know, that's not in my fiction anywhere. It was, but that's just part of my life and how I live my life and, or, or how I talk about, it's just like, yeah, I, I guess it's in some way, um, a habit of being within um, the uh, Boggs, Haynes, uh, uh, Boone uh, families that I come from, that that, that is how we um, talk about dreadfulness. You know, we kind of talk about it over and over and over <laughs> again. Um, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe Jill can speak to this. Maybe that's who is also one of the funniest writers I know. Maybe that there's something like particularly Southern about that, just talking about, you know, to, to your certain close um, companions, um, not everyone, um, what it is that, you know, that is dreadful. Or maybe, yeah. oh, sorry. sorry. Maybe it's also like taking it and looking at it like, a, as like a prism like from all different angles and all different sides until like the dreadfulness until it's like you know a geode when you a geode when you crack it open is really beautiful on the inside but uh the dreadful moment from all different angles loses its dreadfulness if you can name all of the different angles of it yeah, I love that. I love that yeah. that metaphor using a geode. Although I think that this hospital was just like an ugly rock, but at least it's paperwork. <laughs> I was going to say sometimes I think um, being given permission, you know, for humor that that we not outgrow that humor we're all born with. And that, you know, there are always these little slivers. I mean, I my favorite cousin growing up would preface everything, especially the most horrible things with, now this is serious, so don't laugh. <laughs> and of course, every story she told, it was serious, it was awful, and we would just be on the floor laughing, you know? <laughs> so there was something about permission of that release. And, and it really is comic relief. I mean, it really does relieve tension. I mean, you know, and during this pandemic, I mean, what what would we have done without Saturday Night Live? Though, though their their work has been pretty easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but still, I mean, the the humor um, puts it all in perspective. I think you just you you read such wonderful examples. I've been here just taking notes the whole time. Oh, Elise, I can't believe that. That's so funny about, uh, <laughs> see, I will, I'm going to copy and paste Elise's, uh, uh, comment into, um, like a document so I can just in case my parents go back there because it's close to central garage. Mm -hmm. I can uh, tell you so much more. <laughs> we can talk sometime. Yeah. Great. Good. <laughs> Um, there's another question. Can you try too hard to infuse humor into work? How do you know or feel when you're being contrived? Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think, um, 
uh, sometimes, I mean, that's part of like what our, you know, writing groups are for or finding people like you might find in a group at, you know, Vermont Studio Center um, uh, that, you know, people that you would meet, um, you know, reading stuff out loud, seeing what you can cut. I get a really, I have a really hard time, like, you know, I, I, I and I think I especially get tied, um, get connect attached, I guess I should say, to jokes that are really, really particular that maybe like two people are going to get, but I'm just like, I love this, I, you know, and I still won't want to take them out because they're so fun. You know, it's like, because they are so funny to me, I don't want to take them out, but it can be helpful sometimes to take them out. Um, and um, so, yeah, I have a section in the novel that I'm working on now that has like, um, uh, like, beaver double entendre, which is like so old fashioned and stupid, but it's like so funny to me. And I still, and I go, I take it out and then I put it back in and I take it out and I take, and it, so I think that process of like taking things out and putting it back in and, you know, um, you know, killing your darlings, as they say, sometimes your darlings are just your little jokes. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? I mean, Kat, that's a really good point. So Kat has a, a comment. She's writing an, um, a historical book that she's deeply researching um, uh, from 1300 AD. And her tendency is to have her situation or her character be so serious. And this is like a reminder. Yeah, I think like figuring out like how to find humor in characters we're writing about like that, that's one of the reasons that I can't write or at this point in my life I really cannot write a time period like I cannot write like d deeply historical fiction it's hard for me because um because it's really hard for me to access the humor but that doesn't mean that other people don't um they you know or that it can't be done because it can and that's sort of how um uh, you know, that, that's like, that's kind of how we get to their humanity, um, in a way. Um, and so Allison is, um, talking about, um, the concept of, um, she says, I have seen people speaking about humor and the concept of punching up versus down. In Amps, for example, I think there are ways that Elf could have written about that would have been offensive, but it's avoided partially due to Taves's personal experience, but that's probably not all there is to it. How does someone writing dark humor avoid crossing that line? I think that's a really important point that Allison is making. Um, we both love this book. All, I don't know how many of you have read All My Puny Sorrows, but it is so wonderful and it will make you just read all of the rest of um, Taves's work, which is also wonderful. Um, and, you know, so Allison makes reference to um, Taves's own personal experience, which is, includes the experience of loss of family members from suicide. And I think that that particular subject and the subject of um, mental health is addressed um, beautifully in this book in a really serious way. Um, that comes from like deep frustration with um, the uh, way that um, people who suffer from mental health are treated from the medical establishment, from mental health challenges are treated within the medical establishment, especially the sickest people. And, um, and you know, I, I don't think, for example, that I could have written about that subject without having some personal experience. I don't think that I could have brought like my own like Bell Boggs experience to that um, because like I don't ha like in, you know, you know, quite fortunately, I don't have like that particular set of circumstances, but I'm not saying that someone couldn't. Um, I think it would take probably like just really caring about the um, the subject that you're writing about. I think really, you know, I think that um, to go back to Julie Hecht, um, she's someone who um, hasn't published um, fiction in a little while, but she wrote a lot of really great stuff about the terrors of the Bush administration, which Bush, you know, W, which we should not forget, you know, that he was a war criminal and, um, you know, friend of Ellen, a friend of mine. Um, and uh, that, 
you know, that like that terror, the terror of climate change, um, uh, the terror of a changing climate and this like violent, violent American administration that underpins um, all this like kind of like stuff about, you know, um, you know, taking the bus or going to New York, going to Midtown, dentists, what kind of shoes to wear, what kind of dresses to wear, what, you know, what people used to do, what they do now. It, all of that stuff is the fact that it's, uh, you know, there's an underpinning of seriousness is what makes it work for me anyway. And that, that is also true um, in all my puny sorrows um, that like, there's this like great under, underpinning of seriousness and that the relationship between um, Yoli and Elf is rock solid. Like we know that relationship, you know, just 30 pages into the book, we know it well. That's a, re that's a really, really good question though. Does that answer your, the question, Allison? Or does that help? Or does anybody else, else have things to throw in there? One of the things I was thinking about when I was listening to your talk, which was great, thank you, um, was the relationship between humor and impossibility and kind of how humor can be as a, a way to address impossibility and all the you know, different concepts that you've discussed, like you know, the, the impossibility of being like, I need to do something about climate change right now. And the helplessness almost feeling, even though there are things we can do. But um, I, a few years ago, I had my breast removed um, and I received the instructions before the double mastectomy. It was sort of like, these are the things to bring and these are the steps to take. And I thought it was the most hilarious document because it's impossible to prepare, you know, yeah. to have your breasts cut off. And um, so I actually took the instructions and made them into a, an essay, like a hermit shell essay, just kind of responding to them. Um, because I just thought, well, this was a little not helpful. But it was really funny. And um, I think that like bureaucracy language can be a really like rich topic for humor um, for that very reason, because it's almost the, like formal, like this is how we solve something language that just feels so inept or so, you know, just not enough. Um, so I was wondering if that was something that's come up for you, sort of like humor and impossibility, those, that relationship between the I two. I think that's a really great observation. I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but it makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that kind of writing through impossibility and your essay, which I, if you would, I'd love to read, um, the um, makes me think of Barbara Ehrenreich's writing about um, breast cancer culture in a way. Um, and, and, I'm, and I guess health and kind of healthcare is a really interesting thing to think about in that context. There's a, just to get back to all my puny sorrows, there's a, um, there's a great section that I, I think I read to my class, one of my classes last year, where um, uh, the, the Yoli, the narrator, um, after being really frustrated by doctors that she felt were, they were giving up on Elf, they were going to send her home, um, when she was clearly suicidal and trying to just tell them, no, I'm fine. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, they, um, and she writes through like an imagined, um, kind of, situation where the doctor says to her, the psychiatrist on call in the hospital says to her, you know what, I'm, I haven't figured it out yet, but I'm going to keep working on your case. I'm not going to, I'm not going to rest until I, until it's done. And I'm going to, I'm going to be thinking about it in my spare time. And, you know, if that doesn't, and I'll find medication. And if that doesn't work, then I'll try something else. And it's like, very cathartic to read it. I think especially if you've ever struggled with something where you felt like a, a you know, a, a medical professional, a doctor was not taking um, your, you know, your, your case seriously. And it was, it was what you're talking about. It was like a, a, an exercise in, in impossibility, right? This is not a thing because of how our healthcare system works that is going to um, happen, but imagine if it, if it, if it did. And, um, and I think that might be a really good, um, that might be a good exercise. Um, as uh, I think, as you say, to write through um, the, 
um, you know, looking at, um, I've just opened your essay too, so I'll read it after this is done, um, to look at uh, um, bureaucratic language, um, like in documents, uh, medical documents and things like that, but also to like then write your response to it or write your, your you know, your response to what if, right? Like, I mean, we can probably, like those of us who are dealing with like various aspects of you know, the pandemic, those of us with like kids trying to learn at home or those of us trying to teach via Zoom or things like that, there would be something kind of interesting ab about that. Are there any last burning questions or comments? Yeah, go ahead, Amy. Hi. Hi, Bill. Thank you so much for your talk. It was great. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to piggyback on um, what Shannon was saying because I've also tried to write on um, the medical community. I've written several essays um, about uh, just the, you know, the, the frustration of waiting for results and things like that. But I, when I tried to write about chronic illness as a hermit crab essay, I found that the results ended up being I was trying to find the humor in it and I ended up feeling bitter. Like I, there was just so much bitterness and um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how you can separate, you know, just separate emotionally enough to look at it um, all the way around rather than um, just taking it, taking on the emotions of the moment so that you can find that humor. I think that's a really good point. And I mean, even if you're writing something where humor is only kind of skating around the edges, writing anything when you're in the struggle of the moment is hard. And some, sometimes it can produce good results, but sometimes what it's going to produce is a good result that you put aside for a little while and then go back to. A few years ago, I, um, qu I quit um, a really hard job that I took like ethical issue with. Um, it was a teaching job. And I mean, I, I didn't quit because I, you know, I, I got through the year of teaching, but I was, I was really, um, I, I tried immediately to write about it. And I found that I had so much, as you said, bitterness about like what, what I saw happening within that particular school that I had no distance. And so um, I'm sort of just remembering and coming um, back to it um, now, but it, it's like a long time <laughs> later. It's like 10, that was 10 years ago. I don't think I need 10 years at all. I just um, hadn't written about education. So I think like maybe taking time, but not 10 years <laughs> might be something that would be, but, but yeah, I, I do know what, I do know what you're saying. I also think, and I believe this a lot in, in writing any kind of non fiction or essay, I think any time you can um, extend beyond yourself. Um, and, and some of us, like Kat um, Warren here, also is doing that in her fiction too. But if you can, go, if you can interview someone, talk to someone um, who had another kind of similar experience or an adjacent experience, that can also um, be, um, be helpful. And Kat also points out in the comments, and I agree with this too, that some bitterness is mixed with the odd moment of humor and it, that it's fine. And, and I agree with that too. And I think that kind of like, like, you know, there must have been bitterness somewhere in Jill's favorite cousin, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> this is serious. Now don't laugh. Um, Okay, so let's see. And John has a question. Hi, John. Um, like underlying seri uh, uh, there's seriousness at the centers. This underlying seriousness or sincerity is the common denominator among contemporary books and stories that might be classified as humorous literary fiction. Can you think of examples of and or do you feel that genuinely literary books that are funny and don't um, can I think of any genuinely literary books that are funny that don't have something pervasively serious going on? That's a really good question, John. Gosh, you have a hard question. Um, no, I can't. I mean, I, I don't know. Can any of you think of any examples? I can't think of any like that are on like my like bookshelf of favorites um, because even books that have like a lot of um, of lightness to them 
Um, we'll also, yeah, it's really hard to, th it's really hard to think of one. Um, can you think of any, Isabel? No, I'm thinking about it too. I mean, I think the books that I enjoy in that genre, like aren't, they're either not fiction, they're maybe memoir and tend to be a little more, you know, I'm thinking of like um, Amy Poehler's memoir or something like that, where it's like, okay, this is by a comic. This is someone who does comedy for a living. Um, and even then there's, there's underlying life lessons um, and then I think the books that I enjoy that are, are really funny are not lit fic. They're like comedy fiction. But I, I think of like, I have a book by Bob Odenkirk that's called A Load of Hooey. And it's just a bunch of essays and short stories. And they're so funny. <laughs> um, and I don't think that they're... I don't, I think a lot of them don't have an underlying seriousness, but it, it sort of is venturing into other territory. But I guess that's what I would think of as like, is books by people who are wonderful writers, um, but are not trying explicitly to be in the literary fiction genre. That's a great question. It's going to, that's going to stick with me today. Yeah, that's a really good, like, construct for thinking about it, right? Because someone like Bob Odenkirk is or maybe Steve Martin, you know, who also writes, you know, they're also performing, right? They are performers. And I think that that's a little, and, and Kat and um, a couple of people mention um, Sedaris and, but, uh, and, um, but yeah, a lot of his best writing has a dark edge. And then there's also the cumulative experience of reading his writing over his career, right? Where you read one essay and then it is also anchored by the knowledge of other things that you kind of learn about his family and how he grew up or th other things that happened to his sister. He's also written about suicide and suicidality really like, you know, really, you know, in, in like really poignant, um, beautiful essays and certain that are certainly not meant to be funny. Um, but when, and I think when you see, you know, maybe his work, especially since he started publishing some of his, um, some of his diaries, you know, you kind of see his work and his life in this kind of overall cumulative con, um, construct where you see that like the whole thing and you kind of, you, you know, there, you can see other darkness, dark moments, um, uh, like peeking out as Amy is pointing out in these sad moments in his life. This is a book that I also really love um, uh, to teach from this little book. I remember um, by Joe Brainerd, which is um, you know, a, a book that is, I guess it's a book of poetry and um, it comes from performance and um, that he used to do in coffee shops in New York after he moved from Oklahoma to New York City in the late 60s um, uh, and uh, early 70s. And um, he, um, each line in the book starts with, I remember, and a lot of it is childhood. And so I can use this book in like, um, a, you know, I've used it actually, I do a little Zoom if anyone has any first grade, kindergarten through second graders, they're welcome to join our free Zoom class that we do on Mondays and Friday afternoons at 2.30 Eastern time. But I've read some of this from, um, to those kids. And then I've also read it to like college students and I just pick different things, right? I'm not, um, the, um, so part of what um, underlies um, Brainerd's um, memories is the realization that he was growing up queer in Oklahoma in the 1950s and um, was, you know, in this like very, um, you know, was like in this like very straight world and, you know, and felt like an outsider. Um, and that's, you know, imbued in the little memories of like what, you know, of like what shops looked like or what like little quotes or things from, um, from, uh, commercials and things like that. And then, um, and so it's, it, it, I think it's a really, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll type the, the book down. It's, it, it's, it's a great, I've bought so many copies of this because I always wind up giving it to somebody or, you know, I just, I like to have one at home and one at school because it's, it's a great like little prompt to just say, I remember 
as the beginning of every line and then like just list as many memories as you have, uh, as you can think of. Yeah, and that, oh, um, whoops, I wound up, yeah, so that's in there. It's, uh, yeah, great. So, um, yeah, and he was, a, he was a great friend of Ron Paget's who also did a lot of great, like, uh, well, a poet, but also a poet in the schools. And um, so, um, so, uh, yeah, I think that, um, are there any other burning questions or comments for Bell? And then I'm, I'm going to drop some resources into the chat for you all. Um, the first one is Bell's website. <laughs> um, uh, for more reading of Bell's work. And um, there are, as of today, there are three slots left for one on one manuscript consultations with Bell. Um, if you're interested, um, you'd want to sign up kind of pretty quickly because the slots are um, next week. And I'm going to drop in my email, my work email address. Um, uh, yeah, I just put something in the in the chat too, and I'll throw my email in here too. Anybody who has any questions and stuff? The manuscript consultations are one hour and um, nine pages of prose or six pages of po poetry, one poem per page. And um, there are, it's $100. And there, are, there is financial assistance available if you need it. So if you're interested, you would want to email me and arrange that by the end of the day today, um, by around 4 p.m. today. Um, thanks so much for joining us. We have a bunch of other virtual events um, on our event calendar, which I just dropped into the chat as well. Um, and let me know if you have any questions and let's give Belle another round of applause. Thanks so much for being with us, Belle. Yeah, thank you all for being here.